Hi everyone. <clears throat> uh, so this is the lecture uh, that accompanies the PowerPoint for human osteology and bipedalism. Before I start, hopefully everyone's been able to access these videos. You, uh, the, I, I checked everything on Canvas and it looks like it's pretty straightforward. Um, however, let me know if there's an issue, but it seems as if based on a few student emails I received, they're, they can see the videos, it's working just fine. I don't think there's anything else before we get started. Um, I'll just reiterate, like I said before, if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to email me. But um, if you watch that very first video, it's called, I think, Course Changes. It kind of explains how everything's going to work from here on out. Uh, so I assumed you all have watched that, and um, <clears throat> so we'll just get started on this lesson. So just like with the previous one, um, you can watch me on the video, and hopefully you have the PowerPoint pulled up next to you, uh, or in the screen next to you, next to it. Um, and we'll just we'll we'll go along these slides together. It's not ideal, but this is the way it's you know going to have to work for now. Uh, like I mentioned before, hopefully we'll be able to do a live stream. Um, which then you'd still be able to access the video later, but at least that way we'd be able to talk in real time. That would obviously be the ideal situation. Um, so I guess we'll just get started. <clears throat> so on the human osteology and bipedalism PowerPoint, uh, there's the, of course, the title slide, then the second slide, so slide number two, the skeletal system. So there's some general information there that it supports and protects the body, stores minerals, especially calcium. We had talked about that in class before. And uh, it's also the site for blood cell formation. So you probably notice there's a picture right next to uh, these, uh, the, the, the bullet points. Uh, it looks like a syringe and uh, an alcohol swab. So you guys are very familiar with the fact that I like to kind of give personal examples of how this um, stuff relates to us in our personal lives. Um, so I had shared with you all before that I had gone through cancer treatment and <clears throat> during some of that treatment, during the chemotherapy, the, uh, I mean, most of you as adults in the world are probably familiar with this, but when you go through chemotherapy, your immune system drops significantly. Um, like you're, you're susceptible to so many things and uh, it has uh, a lot to do with the, um, the, the white blood cell count um, that your body's naturally producing, the levels of that are greatly affected by the chemotherapy. And um, while I was going through treatment, because my white blood cell count dropped very low, even lower than they would expect to see for someone going through chemotherapy was exceptionally low, I had to give myself these self-injections. And basically what the um, injections did was it stimulated my bones, hence like why it's pertinent to this, this uh, PowerPoint. It stimulated my bones to make more blood cells within like like a 24 hour period so very 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 fast so as you can imagine that was quite painful in my uh, legs which is where the majority of the blood product or the the blood production uh, occurs <clears throat> um, but anyway so like we're not really thinking about that stuff like in a normal live like daily lives but this is absolutely something i'm very familiar with so keep that in mind um so going on to the next slide slide three. So there are two main sections, and in the picture you can see this, there are two main sections to the skeleton, the axial skeleton and the appendicular. So in this picture, the axial skeleton is in yellow, so that's everything basically <clears throat> in the main trunk of your body, including your head. <clears throat> and your appendicular skeleton are your limbs and the bones that join your limbs to the main trunk of your body. Um, the, the, the name appendicular, maybe you've heard of limbs being referred to as appendages. So maybe that'll help you kind of remember. So those two main, main parts. So the next slide, slide four. So there's a picture of a, uh, of calipers in case you were wondering. And the reason I put those there was if you take the, the lab with me or with someone else, or you end up taking some kind of osteology course, you'll be very familiar with these. There are a few different types. There are spreading calipers, um, which are the ones shown in the picture, and sliding calipers. And basically these allow you to measure bones, whether, or, whether you're looking at like a femur and you wanna know the length, or you're looking at parts of the head, you might use these uh, spreading calipers to get at certain measurements, like you know maximum length, uh, maximum width, <clears throat> all of those. 
So there's a, and we talked about this earlier in the semester, there's a lot we can know by just looking at the bone. So here on this PowerPoint slide, you have this list of things um, by measuring either with calipers or by taking like, volume measurements or even like visual stuff. You can know things like age, sex, ancestry, stature, uh, even health. So we, we, we definitely talked about this multiple times before. So this is a little review with those bullet points for you. So the next slide, <clears throat> slide number five. Sex determination. So we have mentioned, or I have mentioned this before in this class, that remember, and I, and I put this there on one of the bullet points, remember that sex and gender are not the same thing. Um, if you were taking the intro to cultural anthropology course with me, we would spend many, many days talking about sex and gender, and we spend a lot of time talking about gender and society and all that. <clears throat> but for this class, we don't talk about that. I'm only here to mention that it's not the same thing as sex. So remember that for Gender, it is how either you view yourself socially or the rules imposed upon you by society. You can't tell any of that information by looking at bones. You can't know how someone uh, felt about themselves socially if you're just looking at someone's bones. You can't tell what rules were imposed upon them, whether they were male or female, like the gender roles. You can't tell any of that information from, from the bones alone. What you can tell is whether they were male or female. And we talked about this before when we were talking about secondary sex characteristics, <clears throat> um, those, those, those morphological changes that happen um, during puberty. So for females, the widening of the hips, um, obviously like soft tissue stuff like breasts, for males, hair growth. Um, so we, we discussed that before. So just remember that, that humans are sexually dimorphic Sex is a binary. We can absolutely tell the difference between male and female. Even though there's variation between males, even though there's variation in females, they are absolutely two different groups. Remember that a binary does not mean that... It does not mean that there aren't any exceptions to the rules or statistical outliers. It's not what that means. And I think, I forget which PowerPoint I had that information on. I had that you know nice little graph I showed you about the the um, um, on the graph of the of sex as a binary anyway so when you're looking at the bones you can absolutely tell whether someone was a male or female sometimes you'll get someone who's kind of in between it's a little hard to tell and some people will it'll be way easier to tell and and others not quite as much um, but we're going to go through a handful of the the different morphological features uh, that you can use to be able to determine uh, sex male or female, if you just had bone, if you just had skeletal material. <clears throat> so slide number six. So the best areas, there are two main like general areas if you have the pelvis and if you have the skull. And we're going to talk about both of these uh, in detail. So I had this question on the PowerPoint, why are these the, the best two regions? So normally in class, I'd ask you, hey, does anyone know the answer to this? Some people would answer. So I'll just tell you, um, for the, the pelvis, this should be no surprise to you guys that we talked about this, that uh, there are major differences between males, human males and females because of childbirth. So obviously the pelvis, that, that region, the hips, um, those, those bones, which we'll talk about, those are obviously like some of the best areas to be able to, to determine sex. If you had no other part of the skeleton and you just had the, the pelvis area, you would, you would be able to tell. And the other region is the skull. So there are a lot of differences in the skull um, for between males and females. We'll talk about some of those in detail. I have those on, on the PowerPoint as well. Um, but before we even get into the details, it should be no surprise to you. Imagine, like, so I know, I, I think I gave this example before, like when someone's chewing, you know, you can see the muscles. So a lot of those muscle attachments in males are more, are just larger. Uh, the, the mandible has a different shape. We'll talk about some of these examples as we go through the slides. But just so you know, the pelvis and the skull are the two best regions to have. So in the next slide, slide number seven, I have a, a, um, a bullet pointed list of the different things that we're going to talk about. So I think I have a slide for each of these. So we'll just continue. Looks like there are some for the pelvis. Looks like four things we'll talk about for the pelvis and five things for the, the skull. So I'm pretty sure, like I said, I have a slide for each of these. So we'll go through those. So the next slide, slide number eight, the pelvic outlet or inlet. <clears throat> So if you're looking at this picture, I know it's hard because like I can't point to it and you can see, but if you're looking at this picture right now on slide eight, where it says pelvic outlet slash inlet, 
you're looking at, you're seeing the pelvis and you're seeing that opening. And we talk, we talk about this in class before that opening, depending on if you're looking like from the inferior or superior view, there's that, there's that large space. And if you're a female, that space obviously has to be wide enough for, um, a, uh, for, for your offspring to be able to, to go through that. Um, for a male, you don't have to have that option. So the, the shape is going to be very different for females. Um, obviously the shape is going to be wider. Uh, it tends to be rounder. Uh, there's not anything obstructing it for males. It tends to be, and you can see this in the picture for males, it tends to be a little like narrower, sometimes even like a heart shape <clears throat> because it doesn't need to be any larger for, for anything else to fit through it. But the female has to have that. So the next slide, slide number nine. Uh, pubis shape. <clears throat> so you can see the picture on the left is showing two. Um, so you might be wondering like where where's the pubis um, and like I can't really point to it. You know, uh, if you if you googled you can you know see some pictures. But basically, so you have this your your pelvic bone. Um, it's called the oscoxa. You have a left side and a right side. Um, when in the very front where they meet together, um, they meet. They, those two, the left pubis bone and the right pubis bone articulate with each other. So they're meeting together. So you have two. So that, that's what this picture is showing, the one on the right. It's showing that, that connection between those two. That's actually a picture of my pelvis I had to have. I mentioned this to you all before that I had um, a sterilization procedure and they had to do some x-rays after. And so, but anyway, so I got a really cool picture of my, at least the pubis area. You can see... Um, uh, mine fairly clearly. So for this one, when you're looking at this, and hopefully you can see this in the picture, the picture on the left with those two different, uh, um, the, the, the female pubis and the male pubis. So the female pubis tends to be a little more square shaped and or even rectangular. So if you look at mine, mine's a rectangular and the males tends to be a little more triangular. The reason what this does is the wider, the more square, the more rectangular, it's creating more space. So you can see in mine, mine's, re if mine's rectangular. It's, create, it's actually elongated this area, and all that's doing is just widening the hips a little bit more. Um, so like I said, for females, it tends to be square and or rectangular. Males tends to be triangular. So the next slide, um, slide number 10. Subpubic angle. So luckily this picture is showing you this very clearly. So if you look at these two uh, uh, pelvis, you have the one on the left, the one on the right. The one on the left is the female. The one on the right is the male. And it's labeled very clearly. You see there at the, towards the bottom of, of the pelvis, it says subpubic angle. Uh, so this is what I want to get at. So for females, like just, just if you kind of remember that for females, everything's kind of bigger and wider. This is true for this angle. For females, it tends to be more obtuse. For males, it tends to be more acute. Um, so just the wider the angle, the more likely that, it, that it's female. So that one's, that one's pretty easy. <clears throat> so the next slide, slide number 11, sacral curvature. So we talked about the sacrum before. So that's at the bottom of your, your, your uh, vertebral column. So you have your left oscoxa and your right oscoxa. Those, the larger bones of your, your pelvic bones are articulating um, we know one on the left, one on the right, they're articulating in the front, they're coming together in the front. But there's that bone in the back where they attach as well. So that's the sacrum. And you can see this is a, a nice side view for the female um, and the male. For the female, it's showing, um, let me see which one it is. So the female is the one on the left, sorry. The male is the one on the right. And you can see for females in general, they tend to be not as curved. Um, and if you go back to slide number eight, you'll, you'll see why that's the top down view. The more curved it is, the more likely it is to obstruct that pelvic inlet or outlet. So for males, they tend to be a little more curved, females a little straight. That's what I want you to know for that one. Uh, okay. So those are the features for, hold on one second. Those are the features for the pelvic area. So now we have the features for the, <clears throat> the skull. So we'll talk about these. So slide number 12, uh, superciliary arches. So you can see this great picture that I sort of helped uh, make um, highlighting this, this exact area. So it, it's, it's this area right here, superciliary arches. So imagine like right on your bone, about where your eyebrows would be. So I always remember like superciliary arches, like your eyebrows are arched. So remember, it's like right about there. So for females, this area of the forehead tends to be flat, pretty much. 
Um, for males, now in this picture, this is like an extreme example. Not every male will have this feature, but this is kind of showing like the hyper-feminine, hyper-masculine. Most people will kind of be somewhere like in between, but um, just so it's clear. So the female, it's basically completely flat. And the males will often have, you know, a little bit of raised bone here. Sometimes a little bit, sometimes a lot. And if you can imagine like the men in your lives, you can already probably think of that variation. Some have it a little more, some have it a little less. When you think of females, it's probably very unlikely that you know any females who have that. There's probably a few because just like we talked about before, there's always variation for these traits. Um, but you can see like in general, they, these tend to be very different. So the next one, um, slide 13 forehead angle and there you can see I, I pointed that out again um, the male on the left the female on the right uh, for forehead angle what we tend to see is for females we tend to have a very vertical forehead it tends to be very flat males we tend to see a slight curve kind of towards the back and on this slide you can see because it's the nice side view you can see uh, that very clearly the males tends to be slanting back ever so slightly female is pretty flat and just like with any of these features, there's going to be variation. Variation. You might see the occasional man who has a very vertical forehead and a female who has a slightly slanted forehead. Um, that's just variation. But in general, this, this rule is, is accurate. So the next one, <clears throat> slide 14. So the mastoid process. So this is a part of your skull. So you have multiple bones in your skull. And when you take the lab, you'll learn all these bones, the names of the bones, the features on those bones. But there is this one feature called the mastoid process. It's on the temporal bone. And so this is a bone that's like, like right here, kind of behind your ear. Um, so the mastoid process is actually just like a little, like kind of in the back here behind your ear. Um, for males, this, so this is a place where muscles are attaching. So for males, no surprise. It tends to be a little bigger, a little wider. It hangs down a little farther. And for females, it doesn't. So you can see that in the picture that the female's on the left, the male's on the right. Um, the male one is clearly larger. Um, that one's pretty easy. So the next slide, slide 15, mandible. So quite a few things about the mandible, but there are two things that I want you to know. So in general, so the mandible, obviously we talked about this before, that's the, the jaw, your, your, your lower jaw. Um, so there's two, there are two sets of pictures. One on the left is showing like the chin. So for males, what we tend to see is a little more squared off uh, shape. For females, we tend to see a little more rounded and, and pointed. There's always going to be a little variation with that though. Those are the like hyper masculine, hyper feminine. And then the other set of photos, the one on the lower right, it's showing from the side view, this part here, it's called the ascending ramus, like this main part of the bone, this whole kind of section right here. Um, for males, what you tend to see is more of a right angle, so a right angle like this. Females, it tends to be a little more angled back. Um, and then in general, for females, it tends to, that, that, that whole part of the bone tends to be a little thinner, but that angle is really what I want you to know. <clears throat> and then the last one for the, for the skull area is the, called the nuchal region. So you have this area in the back of your head, this is the nuchal region. So this bone is called the occipital bone, and there's this area where muscles from your neck are coming up and attaching. No surprise, men's muscles in this area tend to be a little more uh, substan substantial uh, than females. So the areas where that muscle is attaching um, are going to be less than for in females. So that area of the bone tends to be a little more smoother for females. For males, we tend to see a little more rough or raised area. Now in this picture, it's showing like the extreme, that the muscles are so massive that the body has created this little extra like hook of a bone. Um, that's, that's like obviously an extreme case. But like I said, for these pictures, I want you to see those extreme at, at either end. Most people are gonna be somewhere in between. Males in general tending to have more rough raised areas um, females a little more smooth, but um, you can see here that difference. Okay, so moving on in the PowerPoint to slide 17. So we're going to start learning about hominins. <clears throat> so I've used this term before, and um, I think I even drew you a similar picture on the board at one point, but so hominins with an N, if you see the word hominid with a D, so there's a little confusion without getting like too far into it. Um, basically, that's the older way of saying it, hominid. Um, so if you're looking at an older textbook or you're learning from an older professor, they might use the, those terms interchangeably. Most 
of the paleoanthropologists that I know we use hominin, and it all has to do with, so some of the stuff we talked about earlier in the semester, science is always open to new information, and when we get new information, sorry, something in my tooth, when we get new information, we have to adjust, and so sometimes we even have to adjust classification and naming because we realize, oh, these two species maybe aren't quite as related as we thought, these two are even more related, so now the names kind of have to change a little bit. So this is what ended up happening. So there are three pictures you see on this PowerPoint highlighting three ape species that are very closely related. Gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. Now, if you looked at just those pictures or you saw those three, you know, species out in the wild and you, and someone asked you, like, of those three, we know they're all closely related, but of those three, which two do you think are a little more closely related to each other? Most people, like, intuitively, and it makes sense, would say, okay, well, they're all closely related, but probably the gorilla and the chimp are probably a little more closely related to each other, and the human is kind of the outlier. Like, yeah, they're related, but the chimp and the gorilla are probably a little more closely related than, than, than the human is to either one. That's actually incorrect. Um, it's the human and the chimp that are more closely related, and it's the gorilla that's the outlier. So we talked about this before with when we were talking about uh, phylogeny and taxonomy, that when you first have to kind of start organizing, you go off visuals and that makes sense. Often it works, but there are sometimes when it doesn't. And now we have DNA evidence. So it's a lot easier for us to kind of put these evolutionary relationships and family trees together. So let's see. So for uh, hominins is everything in the human lineage. So everything in our lineage all the way back since our split with chimpanzees. So that was approximately six million years ago. So everything in our lineage. So so chimpanzees, we had we share a common ancestor with them. So remember, we did not evolve from chimpanzees, but we share a common ancestor with them. That common ancestor went into, as far as we know, two different different general trajectories. One eventually became modern chimpanzees. A lot of stuff happened along the way. Eventually, in the other trajectory was was humans. A lot of stuff happened along the way, and that's what we're going to talk about for this. But for, but for hominids, it's everything in that lineage since that split with chimpanzees in, our, in our, our, the human lineage. It doesn't have to be a direct ancestor, and we'll talk about like how that happens, but it's everything since that split. Let's see. And then I have that last bullet point since there are, in, in, our, in our lineage, many derived features. So in, if we were in class, I would say, what does derived mean? Uh, we talked about it the other day. Remember that derived, a derived feature is any like new interest like any new feature that happens like in evolutionary time so when you see those those new features that are happening um that's a derived feature it's not an ancestral feature they don't all share it it's something new that happens this happens all the time plenty of uh species develop you know something interesting new so for humans we talked about this already bipedalism and that's going to be on this list <clears throat> it's a new feature we were quadrupeds before then probably shouldn't be drinking wine on school video okay I keep forgetting. So, okay, the next slide. Slide 18. So, all hominids share these traits. So, we recall that we talked about... What are you doing? So, recall that we talked about primates. We talked about this, all those traits that primates share. Getting more and more specific. So, now we can talk about what are the traits that all hominids share. So, remember, this is like a suite of traits, a grouping of traits. It doesn't mean that no other animal or no other group has these features, although like some of them. Okay, so the first one. Oh, so, I, so there are six features, but I think I have a slide for each. So actually, we'll just we'll just move on. But before I do, there's that last bullet point that says it's important to remember what's called mosaic evolution. So this is not a new force of evolution. We talked about those five forces of evolution. This is not a new type. It's just more of a conceptual idea. That when we're looking at these features, so like a grouping or a suite of traits, a suite of features, um, a group is defined by like this this group of this this group of uh, characteristics. Remember that those features did not happen at the same time, and they didn't happen at the same rate. That is what mosaic evolution is. They didn't happen at the same time, and they didn't happen at the same rate. So while we can say the, these six features um, characterize hominins we are included in that. Uh, all these features didn't suddenly happen at the very first hominin and it's been that way ever since. No, some of these happened earlier before the others, some happened at the beginning and kind of were a slow process, some happened very quickly. Like, we'll talk about these individually, but just know for mosaic evolution, that's what that means. They didn't happen at the same time and they didn't happen at the same rate, even though as a group, these features define 
hominids. Okay, or any other group you're talking about. So slide 19, large brain. So in the picture, you can see that there's a, a chimpanzee and a human. Now remember, we did not evolve from chimpanzees, but we kind of are using them as an analog to looking at um, the ancestral state <clears throat> because they probably didn't change much since then. So uh, modern humans have a, have a cranial capacity of 1,300 to 1,400 cc, so that's cubic centimeters, whereas modern chimpanzees only have uh, about 400 cc, so a huge difference. And even on the visual, you can see, you can see that that's a big difference. But also remember that we talked about this idea of a larger brain. So we talked about how primates have a larger brain than non-primates. But remember, it's not always about, about absolute brain size. It's about that thing we talked about called encephalization quotient or EQ. So it's looking at the size of the brain compared to the size of the body essentially. For for mammals when you're or for animals when you're looking at the brain size is the brain larger than you would expect for an animal of that size. So for humans, for any other animal the same like ma body mass you would expect to see on average a much smaller brain. The fact that we have a larger brain, that means we have a higher EQ. So animals, we talked about this before, animals that have a high EQ, that typically it translates to they have higher like cognitive abilities, although, you know, we're still learning a lot about that. So this is the point where I would ask you, you know, which animals do you think have a high EQ? So we talked, uh, I think we talked about this a little before, so no surprise, humans, um, apes, uh, dolphins, I think we talked about this before, you get the idea. So when, you, when the animal has a larger brain than you would expect for an animal of that size. So the next slide, bipedalism. So we just had the um, PowerPoint on primate behavior, primate anatomy and behavior. And we talked about those four types of locomotion for primates, so bipedalism being one. Now currently, we are the only primate that exists that is bipedal, but this there have been other bipedal primates in the past. They're just not currently existing anymore. They're extinct. But right now, we're the only one that's currently bipedal. So you, we learned about this already. This is walking on two limbs, so using your hind limbs or your legs. You can see the nice picture of that. Um, this one's pretty easy, you guys know this. So this is a feature that defines our group. So since our split with chimpanzees, chimpanzees remained quadrupedal, humans became bipedal. This is like super important. The next one, uh, slide 21, reduced prognathism. So prognathism, if you recall, is the projection of the face. So it, like essentially is there kind of like a snout. So imagine like your dog, most of you have like dogs or cats, like they tend to be what's called prognathic, especially dogs. They have more of a snout. A lot of other animals have this projection to some degree. Humans and this group hominins, um, we tend to see a much uh, much less prognathism. For humans, we essentially have no prognathism. This is actually called um, what's called orthognathic. So essentially, that just means a flat face that we have no prognathism. But we'll see this. This is one of those features that will decrease. Like in that, in six million years, we'll get a little flatter, a little flatter, a little flatter, a little flatter. So we're seeing that reduction in, in prognathism, the projection of the face out like a snout. And then slide 22 has the last two uh, items on that, on that uh, bullet point list. Um, let's see, no CP3 hone or honing complex and thick enamel on the teeth. So these both are related to teeth. So we talked about canines and primates. Many of them have that very large uh, canine. For hominins, we pretty much see the reduction of the canine pretty early, fairly early on. But this is what's called a CP3 hone or honing complex. So um, canine and the first premolar, essentially. So if you're looking at this picture, you see a really large upper canine and then you see the lower canine, which is pretty like moderate size, and then that first premolar. And what you'll see is that that large canine is, is so big that the lower canine and the th and the, the first premolar actually have kind of like separated a little bit. That space that's kind of allowing for that larger upper canine is called a uh, diastema. So the hominids, we don't have this whole complex of like the slanted lower canine and the diastema and the large upper canine and this serves for the space and also serves to kind of sharpen the canine. We don't have any of this feature. So we pretty much see a reduction in the canine pretty early on 
in the hominid lineage. And then the other one's thick enamel. So for most other, uh, for all other apes, they tend to have thin enamel on the teeth. So it's probably had something to do with dietary changes. There's still research going on on this. Um, but we have, for all the species in our lineage, uh, very uh, thick enamel. So defining feature. So now we've gone over those six features of uh, that define, that characterize uh, hominins. And so let's see the next slide. Oh, wait, there was one more. I forgot. Okay, sorry, guys. Slide 23, parabolic dental arch. So you see the picture is parabolic. So a nice curve like this. You imagine like the teeth in your mouth, you have a nice curve to the teeth. This is in contrast to what we call parallel tooth rows, which is common for like a chimpanzee, where it's kind of like, like this. There's not a nice kind of arch to it. And this is related to the reduction in prognathism. So we have the same number of teeth and the teeth are like approximately the same size, but we have much smaller faces. We don't have that big snout anymore, or even a little bit, but we have the same number of teeth. So the teeth kind of have to like move to kind of fit in that space. So now we have this nice arch to the teeth. So versus like, you know, more projection. Okay. Now we can move on from that. So those are the features. So slide 24, types of bipedalism. One second. So this is just kind of referencing the idea that we have species that are what are called obligate bipeds. So this humans are obligate biped. We practice bipedalism all the time. We're not kind of transitioning between bipedalism and vertical clinging, leaping, or brachiation. This is, but we're, we're bipeds. This is what we do all the time. We don't do anything else. Versus habitual bi bipedalism where, and we see this with, with some of the species in the hominid lineage as, as this trait is evolving, that there were points where certain species used more than one form of locomotion. They might have been in the trees a little bit, maybe using, you know, um, suspension. So there are, the arm morphology might indicate that. And they also were walking bipedally. So we see this in certain species, which we'll talk about, I think maybe on the next PowerPoint, that the, there's a transition. So habitual bipeds would use, uh, would use bipedalism, like they have the morphology for that, but it's not, it's not the only thing they're using and they're not using it like 100% of the time. So the next slide, slide 25. So uh, some more details on bipedal morphology. So we talked about this before that with bipedalism, that transition from quadrupedalism to bipedalism, major, major anatomical morphological changes. So <clears throat> I think I mentioned this last time when we were in class that humans can, I guess, attempt to walk quadrupedally, but if you tried, you couldn't really go very far, what, like 20, 30 feet, maybe without like, falling over. We're all laughing because you can't really do it. Your, your, your limbs, one, are uh, not proportioned correctly. The, the muscle structure is not, like, it's just not going to work. And this is true for any quadrupeds who might try to walk bipedally on occasion. So we talked about this with um, chimpanzees and bonobos. will sometimes walk bipedally. But if you, even if you Google this, you'll see like they kind of waddle when they do it. They don't just suddenly start walking like a human, like their bone structure, their muscle structure, it's not set up to be bipedal. So just in that alone, like that very general way, we see that there are major differences, but also there's a huge shift in, in like the spine and our feet because now like we're, it's a complete shift in, in the way we're moving about in the world. So next slide, slide 26, you can see. So this is showing the, the difference between the spine so for humans, we have more of an S-shaped curve uh, for because we're bipeds. I'm sorry, for bipeds, S-shaped -S curve. And for quadrupeds, they tend to have uh, more just like, like a one kind of like single arch. So for humans, we have two spinal curves, the cervical, which is up here, and the lumbar, which is down lower. We might, we might have talked about this, I'm not sure, that those that those, de don't, those develop during the, an individual's life. So the cervical curve, this one kind of starts developing when that individual can start holding up their head. And we talked about this before with humans being altricial. This is definitely common among hominins that they can't really hold up their head at first. And once they can do that, then that, that feature starts to form. And then the lumbar curve will start to form when uh, that individual starts walking. Remember that the main difference between these two things for quadruped versus biped is that for biped, half of your body weight is now 
like on your pelvis, all of your body weight is now on two limbs versus four. So it's going to shift a lot of things. So the next slide, slide 27, you can see uh, there's a picture. It's showing three legs and it's showing a, looks like a human, another, another biped in the middle, and then the chimpanzee. So hopefully you notice some major differences. The pelvis shape for one, very different. So for, for bipeds, we are half of our body weight is sitting on our pelvis. For quadruped, it's, it's not. So their pelvis is shaped quite differently. And the shape of the leg is very different. Now, if we were in class, I would do a nice demonstration and like walk, which you can't probably see that on the video. When we walk, our, our legs are kind of angled in like towards the knee. Um, this is, you'll see this on, on the PowerPoint, the, the bullet point, it's called a valgus knee, that our femur is angled in. This just allows us for um, more efficient walking bipedally, uh, a better center of gravity when we're walking. And we also, uh, on our feet, we have, so we, we talked about this before, we have a non-divergent big toe, or what's called a non-divergent hallux. Hallux is the scientific name for big toe. Um, for all other primates, I'm, I'm sorry, for, if you're looking at, if you're looking at this picture, this like general, like ape, if you're looking at this, you see like they have like their big toe on their feet is just like our thumb on our hands. It's opposable. It sticks out to the side. Um, we are kind of the weird ones in that our feet aren't like this. This is because we're bipedal and we need that all those toes to be in line for better support and all that. And we also have a second arch to our foot. So if you go to the next slide, Slide 28, you'll see this. So you can see the picture of the chimpanzee foot and compared to um, a human foot. And you can see one, there's that divergent hallux, that big toe they have, it's opposable. We don't have that feature. And the picture on the right, you'll see um, the arches. So you can see that we have, so when you think of an arch, you think of like the one kind of going from your toe to your heel. That's one, that's the longitudinal arch. So, we have that as like a form of like shock absorption on our feet because our all of our body weights on our on our on two limbs on our feet. Uh, the quadrupeds don't have that. They they don't. You can see that from the picture. Like it's just it's flat. But we have another arch to our foot, the transverse arch, kind of going from left to right. Um, we don't really tend to think of that one. It's not as prominent as the other. But we have that little arch, you know. And the quadrupeds also have that. So they have that trans transverse arch, and uh, we do too. But they other the quadrupeds do not have a longitudinal arch so the next slide bipedalism in childbirth so we talked about this a lot like once we so so here i have on the on the bullet point what's called the obstetric dilemma so there's a lot of research dedicated to this either being proponents of it or opposing it and like it's a whole thing people dedicate their whole careers to understanding just this thing it's very very interesting but basically the idea behind this is that once we became bipedal, childbirth drastically changed. And you can see here in the picture that uh, the comparison between a chimpanzee and a human that, well, one, human heads, like babies' heads are a little, are bigger. That's, that's obviously true. Um, but the shape of the pelvis drastically changed from a quadruped to a biped the the area for that that space for anyone to birth for females to birth is, is is completely shifted and you can see here in this picture the chimpanzee compared to the human that the space it's much much more difficult for human females to give birth now if we were in the cultural class we talk about like the social implications for that uh, there it's very interesting but just understand for like osteologically that it that it drastically changed things so then there's this whole debate about well does that mean like we are birthed sooner than we maybe normally would have been because otherwise we wouldn't fit? Like it's, it's like, you can imagine there's so many like interesting implications, like what's going on hormonally, uh, what's going on with brain growth. We are born extremely altricial, so extremely helpless. And I think 